Confucius says, a man that has his feet firmly planted on the ground may have trouble putting on his pants. <laughs> Ni hao, everyone. My name is Lao Shan. While I rest, please let me tell you a story. A story thousands of years older than that of Romeo and Juliet. This is one of the four stories that come from Han Chinese. This tale is thought to have been based on two individuals being buried in the same grave, but lived thousands of years apart. Many Chinese feel that the background of the tale is irrelevant to such a timeless folk tale. It's the story of the butterfly lovers. The story of the butterfly lovers is a celebration of an individual's choice of love. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful and intelligent young woman named Ying Tai. She was from a wealthy family, which was also a family that was from a higher class of society. They had servants, and Ying Tai never had to worry about toils of the common folk. Though she enjoyed this lifestyle, she wanted more from life. Ying Tai wanted to attend school, but this was impossible for women of China, for all the schools were male only and women were not allowed to attend. This bothered Ying Tai greatly because she wanted to learn of the world outside. Refusing to give up her dreams, she never stopped trying to persuade her father to allow her to attend school. Finally, her father grew tired of her persisting pleas, and one day, when Ying Tai made the same request, he said, It is not only the knowledge found in books that interests me, but the outside world also fascinates me. I want to see it and feel it. Look at here, Yang Tai. You can't expect me to consent unless you can turn yourself into a man. Fine. Ying Tai replied, biting her lips and holding back her tears as she left the room. Her father was secretly pleased with the effects of his tactics, thinking that this would be the last of their conversations about going to school. The next day, Ying Tai's maidservant reported that her mistress was ill and was confined to her personal quarters. Her father had sent for a physician, and in about an hour, the physician came. Ying Tai's father found something familiar about this young man from whom he had never seen before. Have we met? No, I am new to this town. Tell me what's going on with your daughter. She said she is listless and does not feel like eating or even getting up. From the symptoms you've described, I can tell that your daughter has contracted some strange disease that calls for a special prescription. Are you sure you ain't even seen the patient yet? Let me prescribe her some special medication that you can read off and she'll be all right. Please do. Wait, 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 wait. Dragon's antlers, celestial empress's musk, and water of life from the vase of Guanyin, goddess of mercy. Where in the world can we get these things? You must be kidding. Didn't I look manly enough to you, Dad? Now that Ying Tai had proved she could pass very well for a young man, her father had nothing to say. And he consented to her going to the nearest boarding school, which was 18 miles from their home. In order not to reveal their identity, her father gave her enough money so that she could rent a house separate from the dormitories of all the other male students. He also ordered her maidservant to go with Ying Tai to help with the daily chores both dress and act like males. Ying Tai, along with her maidservant, made farewell to her parents and set off for the boarding school. Stopping at a restaurant halfway through the journey, Ying Tai met a young man. Hey, my name's Shambo. What is your name? My name is Ying Tai. Well, Ying Tai, do you go to school anywhere? I do. I attend Motlo. Motlo? That's where I go to school. Would you like to walk together? After lunch, they set out to school together. As they walked and talked, Ying Tai and Shambo's friendship bloomed. Before reaching the school, Shambo, not knowing Ying Tai's female identity, asked that they become sworn brothers. And Ying Tai readily consented. They both told each other each other's birthday. Ying Tai, I have a one more question for you. What year were you born in? I happen to be born the year of the monkey. Well, Ying Tai, I was born in the year of the rooster. That makes me one year older than you. As Shambo was a year older, he became the elder brother and Ying Tai the younger. 
Dropping to their knees, they kowtowed three times, and finally they vowed to heaven that even though they weren't born on the same year, that they would die on the same day. Well, Ying Tai, after meeting you and getting to know you better, I believe that we should become sworn brothers. Oh, that would be great. Ying Tai, even though we were not born in the same year, we will die on the same day. Let's make a promise to each other to always be sworn brothers. No, no matter, matter what, what happens, happens throughout, throughout our life, we will we'll forever, forever be sworn, sworn brothers. brothers. The two finally arrived at school, and after the weeks, they became inseparable. They even shared the same views in class discussions. One day, the teacher was lecturing on the Confucian perceptions that women were inferior to men. To the surprise of the entire class, Ying Tai objected that women could be as intelligent as men, given equal opportunities. Their inferiority was due not to their nature, but to the oppression of the male-dominated society. All of the students cheered, wondering why a fellow male student should speak up for a weaker sex. The Yang Shambo stood up in the defense of Ying Tai's argument. He said firmly, I agree with Ying Tai, not because he is my brother, but because there's a whole lot of truth to what he said. Take my mother, for example. She is every bit as smart as my father, but she did not have a chance to receive a formal education. She was illiterate not because she did not want to study or was un unable to learn. She was so because her father would not let her be otherwise. Then it was my father who prevented her from going to school after their marriage. That argument is not adequate. We are talking about the people we know, that is. People of consequence. Well, how about Mulan? Retorted Shambo. Ying Tai suddenly felt that Shambo stood very tall and the sunlight from the window behind his shoulders, his masculine figure, was something like a halo. She had never felt so close to a man. She realized that she was falling in love with him. However, she had to suppress her feelings, because in the eyes of Shambo and all the other fellows, she was a he. Since Ying Tai and her maidservant lived separately from the male students, they had no difficulty concealing their femininity. One incident, however, was close call. One day, Ying Tai fell ill and did not show up for class. Being the sworn brother of Shambo, insisted on moving into the residence. Ying Tai, you haven't been at school. I was, uh, sick today. Well, if you're sick, I should move in with you and take care of you. I don't think that would be a good idea, because then I would give you my sickness. Besides, my maidservant is here to take care of me. Three years of school life had solidified Shambo's brotherly affection for Ying Tai, and Ying Tai's love for Shambo. Soon they graduated. By now, Shambo and Ying Tai found it difficult to part from each other. Shambo wanted to walk Ying Tai home after school. Ying Tai, you have a really long way to walk home. Would you like me to accompany you? I was actually hoping that you would ask me that. Because who would be better to walk with me besides my best friend? Considering this to be her last chance to express her feelings for her beloved Shambo, Ying Tai suggests that on their way home, they try to play a verse contest to make the 18-mile journey more interesting. She didn't explain the rules of the game. Let's play a game. You come up with the first line, and I'll come up with the second. Line to match yours. Also, it has to be about what we see on our way. Ah, I like that idea. Seeing a woodchopper passing by, he began. There comes a woodchopper in haste. Though tired, he intends no time to waste. From whom is he toiling? With whom are you traveling? He is working for his wife. And I am traveling with my friend. <laughs> it could be the other way around. You must be crazy. Um, you are a man. How can you be my wife? Well, if you were a woman, I would certainly marry you. Why are you blushing, Ying Tai? The unsuspicious Shambo started another verse as they came up to the bridge. Brother with brother stands above the water. Fish after fish swim beneath the bridge. Fish that swim together may quickly be apart. We that stay together may surely be asunder. 
Come on, Ying Tai, what has happened to you? How come you are so pessimistic? Fish would never separate if they weren't caught. As for us, we will always visit each other. Haven't you heard the proverb, only mountains never meet? The dense shampoo could not fathom the heart of a young woman like Ying Tai. Ying Tai suddenly cheered up as she caught sight of a pair of mandarin ducks, a symbol of long-lasting love, playing on the water. See, over there, a couple of yang yang. For life, they're a loving couple, never parting from each other. In case I'm a female bird, do you want to be my partner? Don't be silly, brother Ying Tai. Even if you were a mandarin duck, you would be a drake. As they approached Ying Tai's home, Ying Tai had to make her proposal more obvious with the limit of social norms that forbid young people to express their love explicitly. I have a twin sister who looks, thinks, and acts exactly like me. Come to my home to propose to her after you get home and have some time with your parents. Prompted by the sense of imminent and perhaps permanent separation, Ying Tai had to resort to this white lie, which she thought wouldn't hurt nobody. Embarrassed as she was, she could not afford to let go of the opportunity of making the man that she had loved for three years her lifelong companion. She added, I will introduce you to my parents when I'm home. Thank you so much, Ying Tai. Shambo thanked his good friend without the slightest idea that the sister she referred to was none other than Ying Tai herself. Before the two realized it, they were near Ying Tai's village. They had to say their goodbyes. Oh, by the way, thank you for walking with me home. Not a problem, Ying Tai. See you later. Bye. Don't forget, I'm coming back to marry your sister, Ying Tai, because I am your sworn brother. When Shambo returned to Ying Tai's home a few months later, he was shocked to find that his sworn brother, Ying Tai, who had studied with him in school for the past three years, was the beautiful young twin sister he had mentioned. He apologized for his denseness in failing to understand Ying Tai's hinted proposal. Shambo asked Ying Tai's parents to give their daughter to him in marriage. I am here to marry Ying Tai. Who are you? I am Shambo. I have been Ying Tai's friend for the past three years at school. Instead of giving their sanctions, they asked a lot of questions. They were particularly interested in his family's social and financial background. For in their days, the concept of marriage between families of the same status was deeply entrenched in the Chinese mind. When Ying Tai's parents learned that Shambo was from a family of moderate means, they rejected his proposal outright. Shambo, if that is your name, what does your father do? Well, my father is an art teacher at a small college. Is that it? Well, what do you plan to become? I plan on becoming the best fisherman in China. That is not good enough for my daughter. Get off my property! Oh. Shambo left Ying Tai's home in despair. The despondent Ying Tai did not know what to do. Tears were her companion, not day. When a spoiled young man named Ma Wencha sent a matchmaker to propose marriage to Ying Tai, Ying Tai's snobbish parents readily accepted because he was from a wealthy family. Ma Wencha was a classmate of Ying Tai and Shambo. Ying Tai knew how selfish he was. In fact, no one in class liked him. Ying Tai's objections, no matter how vigorous, proved useless. Her parents had made up their mind not to let their daughter marry the poor scholar like Shambo. Back home, Shambo pined away thinking of Ying Tai, night and day. Without her, his life seemed empty. Soon he fell fatally ill, and on his deathbed, he asked his grieving parents to bury him at the side of the road where the two had met. Bury me beside the road where I first met Ying Tai. When the news of Shambo's death came, Ying Tai was surprisingly composed. Her tears seemed to have dried up. She unexpectedly gave up the fight against marriage arranged by her parents. When the wedding day arrived, she dressed herself carefully. She first slipped into a white gown, worn for the occasion of mourning, and then put on her red robe. Before the wedding procession set out, Ying Tai asked to visit Shambo's grave. On the way, 
to her bride's groom's home. Take me by Shampoo's grave before the wedding procession starts. I would rather die than get married. Her bridegroom's relatives were very reluctant to satisfy her demands, for they deemed it ominous for the wedding to be mixed up with a visit to the graveyard. However, knowing that Ying Tai meant what she said, they had no choice to comply. When the wedding processions arrived in Liang Shambo's burial ground, Ying Tai asked to halt her sedan chair. When she flipped the curtain open and stepped out, her appearance stunned everyone. She was in a white morning gown. She had removed the red robe in the sedan. Ying Tai rushed to Shambo's grave, threw herself upon it, and began to lament. She sobbed. Shambo! I'm here with you. I'm sorry I'm late, but wait and take me with you. As if her words were a spell, suddenly a storm sprang up. A loud crack of thunder was followed by a streak of lightning, which split the grave. Wasting no time, Ying Tai jumped into the crevice, which then closed itself. The sky cleared as fast as the storm had struck. When the startled relatives and participants in the wedding procession pulled themselves together, they saw a pair of beautiful butterflies flying out of the grave. They were dancing joyously in a free air under the sky. Even today, the Chinese believe that the butterflies are an undaunted spirit of a faithful love of young lovers.